Hi. So just to uh, the lady who just asked the question, for us, uh, for example, 60% of our sea level are actually women, um, and uh, all of them are parents. I'm the only one in our entire sea level who's not a parent. Um, so uh, there's at least, even not maybe at the founder level, but uh, in our case at the sea level, there's definitely parity on, on both sides. Um, so for the people who don't know Helpling, uh, since we're not in Poland, we're the leading marketplace for household services um, in Europe. and um, when we basically what we do is uh, we help customers find um, cleaners, movers, um, and uh, gardeners, and uh, dog walkers, and so on and so forth. And on the other side, we help uh, those people, um, the dog walkers, um, to basically concentrate on what they're good at. It's on a dog walking. We take care of everything else. We acquire the customers for them. We do um, the bookkeeping and so on and so forth. Um, market opportunity when we started uh, five years ago was, uh, or still is, huge and um, therefore we had a lot of competition back then. Some of those names uh, you don't know anymore, but back then um, also 40 million was an insane amount of money, right? I mean now we're um, very much used to uh, any company raising hundreds of millions of euros um, very, very early on, um, but for us um, it's uh, basically in our market situation, we had American competitors there before we started, um, very well funded. They had all been um, a little bit beaten up by the entire Groupon debacle where we basically, they had rocket internet building up Groupon all around the world uh, before the, uh, they came to Europe, the Americans. So they're very awake this time and actually home joy when they heard that we were about to launch in Germany, they um, actually <laughs> came to Berlin and opened an office there and just a couple of weeks later miserably failed, but um, they still came and, and wanted to compete. We had lots of uh, local competitors, Book a Tiger, one of them, maybe some of you know them. Um, then in every country, basically, local competitors, um, smaller ones, not that well funded, but smaller ones, and a huge black market, um, which is probably still in all of the markets our biggest competitor. Um, so what we needed was a very competitive entry into a market. Yeah? I mean, in this case, you can't go in and say, yeah, I'll figure it out maybe in one city and then one year later we'll scale to the next city, but you need to be very aggressive about it. Yeah. Um, what does that mean? So we basically, um, in year one, raised 60 million, which is a lot, um, and set up companies in 14 different markets. It looks very big because of Canada and Brazil, yeah, but um, 14 countries, four continents, 14 offices, 500 employees, so um, a lot of pain in the ass, to be honest, and um, a lot, of, uh, very little sleep. So this is 2014, and this is 2019, where we're profitable, we're growing faster than we ever did before. We're only in 11 countries. It seems a lot less because Canada and Brazil are gone, yeah, but <laughs> with, it's actually not that less, and also from a business perspective, it's actually bigger. And we're adding a couple of new countries there, like uh, Saudi Arabia and um, Southeast Asia. So I want to talk about a little bit, um, I mean, as how we got from the 2014 picture 2000 to the 2019 picture. Um, we basically tried everything. We did everything wrong and we did some things right. And um, so this should be very interactive. If you have questions, I will make a short um, couple of lessons and then you can just ask questions. Yeah? So question number one or learning number one is your motivation for internationalization yeah? I mean it seems very easy but many people if you ask them why do you want to internationalize the fewest people actually come with a clear um, investment uh, hypothesis for going international yeah um, I'm also a business angel very very often people come in and say yeah the investor I need to raise another round and we need to show yeah, another country and so on and so forth but does your business work in your home market very well? Are you growing like crazy? Yeah, I don't know, um, but uh, maybe it's better in another country. It's never better in another country. If you suck in one country, you will suck in another country as well. Right? Or very often, <laughs> it's personal feelings. I mean, I also love to see our website in Arabic, right? Um, but that should not be the reason why you go to a specific country and sometimes shockingly, people always dreamt of dominating the US market and therefore um, go to the US. Sometimes um, for us, um, it was also um, looking at how the competition looked like. We didn't want to accept other players in Europe. We wanted to, very early on, we set out, okay, we said we wanted to dominate Europe. So the Americans stay in the US, we dominate Europe, we don't piss in their pond, they don't come over. 
and um, then later on we can think about how to split up the world. Yeah? So this was 2014, and um, this is today. We basically bought or killed most of the guys. It was very expensive. But, um, and then regarding the investment thesis, as I said before, um, very few people normally go at it and actually say, okay, what is, um, and especially in marketplaces, if you're really honest with yourself, very, very few times, especially in the marketplace, Michal talked about it before, he has a global marketplace, right? I have a local marketplace, yeah? so I need to match people on a postal code level. Nobody cares if the cleaner in Munich um, is great, but I'm sitting in Hamburg, yeah? so I need the guy in my vicinity, and I need him when I need him. So when is your return on investment into a new market where you're starting with zero liquidity, yeah? higher than it is actually into your home markets? Yeah? So you can see that still, even though we're quite in long time, right? still German cities where we started out have very, very, very good return on investments towards um, in comparison to the existing market or in, into the new markets and are growing very strongly. Yeah. Learning number two, don't be afraid to cut your losses. Yeah? I think as an entrepreneur, it's especially difficult to face the facts and look at something not too positively and basically admit defeat and say, okay, maybe it's better to cut our losses and, uh, and move out of the market. We did that for ourselves. We basically th sold three markets, um, so, so for not the same amount of money that we put in, but it was okay, at least some money back. And um, we shut down one or two markets or put them into sleeping mode. Yeah? Um, but very often, um, I think when you also ask people, it's like, why are you in this market? It's like, yeah, we've always been in this market and we're in this market, right? They're not constantly re-evaluating why are we here, why are we trying to um, compete? Yeah? This is obviously not an issue for someone who's growing 500% year on year in that market. Yeah? But Internationalization is time consuming and expensive. Yeah? Um, again here, I don't want to sound too negative overall. We're actually quite happy with the countries we have now, but it's like a business case. Yeah? It's always coming worse than you expect. Yeah? It's going to be taking longer and it's going to cost more. To give you an idea on time consuming, I mean, in the first year we went to 14 countries. So you have to imagine that on day one when you launch country number one, roughly takes a month to launch one country. So you have 14 months of not working on the country number one, where you now have generated 14 months of learnings and so on and so forth, because you're just on launching more countries and so on and so forth, right? So it's very, very time consuming for not just um, tech teams, but, but also for you as a founder, right? I mean, now you don't think about one market, but you think about multiple markets. In our case, if you think about it, 14 countries, if you just want to allocate one hour of a phone call per week to every country, maybe with another hour of preparation time, you're looking at 28 hours of time and you haven't helped anybody. Yeah? So, or you can hire lots of people taking care of it, but then you build a very large overhead. Yeah? And very high opportunity cost, right? Um, so if you would have stayed just with our initial market, for example, Germany, where we're currently achieving a 66% EBITDA margin, you would think, okay, maybe we should have invested a little more money here. Yeah. Learning number four, buy or build. Um, there's not really a perfect way to enter a market. We've actually tried everything. So we have, I think, entered markets four or five times through acquisition and um, 10 times through building it ourselves. In acquisitions, uh, we have done buying the market leader. We have done buying a small team with a irrelevant company at the moment, but the right vision and uh, drive to give them money and technology and uh, make them win the market. And we have bought a turnkey solution where we basically bought an entire company with a business without employees and stocked that with our employees. And there is <laughs> difficulties to every single one of those. Yeah? So if you're late in the game, you probably need to buy the, the winner, otherwise it gets very expensive. Or if, if the marketplace already has the dominant position in the market, it's very hard to, to attack it early on. I mean, we have, we've talked about that here before. Um, but generally, I would say in a market like ours, which was unproven and very early, it was preferable, or preferable to buy a, a young driven team that is aligned, where you don't have any post-merger integration bullshit afterwards. You just tell them how it is, and they integrate very well, and, and you grow, right? But we also love tuck-ins, yeah? so if you just uh, can buy some revenue, that's also great. 
Um, regarding building, um, what, uh, what we did there is basically we started out with half the countries roughly with like BCG kind of uh, or BCG type um, founders as we call them and the other markets with uh, more entrepreneurial type people. And what we've seen very clearly since our model is very much still very, or it has to be very much localized. It's not a global approach because every market is different in labor law, every market is different in, in the needs of the customer and so on and so forth. And those entrepreneurs did a lot better than um, the BCG type types that um, actually were more looking for a more structured approach already and, um, and copying that. Yeah? So um, we're changing that now when the countries get older and um, it's more about um, just continued execution, um, but um, that's uh, learning from our side. Learning five, obvious one again, yeah? First, achieve <laughs> product market fit before you scale. So if you can, you can't always. So in our case, it wouldn't have worked because everybody else would have eaten our lunch before um, we even started. Um, probably the same for tier, right? You would argue, why do you go to 39 cities um, in, in year one? But uh, there's 50 other people who would do it if you don't. Yeah? Um, otherwise, from product market fit perspective, I mean, what we've seen for us, it just gets very, very expensive because you multiply every single mistake by 10, by 12, by 14, and it gets so much more difficult to then fix it all and continuously improve, and um, it just gets very expensive. Yeah? But if you need to do it, you need to do it. What we've seen is uh, just um, this is a comparison from uh, number one country that we launched on the left side. So basically, it gets uh, if later on, if you do it later on, you're very much faster in doing it. So we didn't take a month, but we took like a week to launch a new country, and they're growing a lot faster yeah, because we figured out how to do it. Um, learning number six so human capital is the key. I think um, here again, as an entrepreneur, you really want to do. Yeah, that's why you're an entrepreneur. You don't want to delegate and give away things and know you want every single market. You want to dig in, you want to understand what's going wrong, what, how can I win this? Yeah? But if you do that, you're splitting your time too thin, right? So better invest into the right people, as I said before, into entrepreneurial type people that you only have to like, send in the right direction and they will figure it out themselves because they really dig into the things and don't wait for orders. Yeah? And make sure that the right culture is there, that you build, um, what we always do is um, basically weekly talks uh, between all the countries, connecting the countries, and I think that's one of the biggest things that we changed is in the beginning we were very centralized and basically told people what to do, build up central customer service and these kind of things. We now completely decentralized everything. And many, many ideas are not flowing from the headquarters to a country, but from country to country. So since then, actually, our best ideas are coming from France to Singapore or from, uh, I don't know, from Italy to the UK or something like that because we really let these people reign, but under the umbrella of a good culture and a very clear goal setting um, that we have for all of them. So I wanted to keep it short, so if you have questions, uh, please shoot away. We've uh, been active in almost any sector, so, uh, yeah. Hi, um, I'll actually have two or three if you allow. The first one is how do you mm, uh, prevent the bypassing of your service uh, in terms of regular service, household services like cleaning or sure. you know, how, how do you deal with that? So in the regular service, I mean, or in general, we split up the service in basically two different areas, right? One is discovery and one is the ongoing service, right? So for the discovery, what we try to do is we try to align the commission system with the value um, proposition that we have for both parties, right? So in the discovery phase, let's say the first three, four executed jobs while you don't know the name of the children yet and you don't have the house key and so on and so forth, we as a platform provide more value. So you as a cleaner are willing to share more of your earnings with us, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have an ongoing decreasing um, value going on because I mean, it's just, we have to face the fact that if I have your name, your address, your phone number, and I know your children's name, that um, you can cut me out. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to make our money very early on, um, and then um, we make a modest amount of money going forward. And the cleaner actually thinks about it in a different way. They don't think about it in a per job value, but they think, okay, I need 500 bucks on a monthly basis. How can I get that, right? And what we offer them is building a profile on the platform, actually massively raising their hourly earnings, so they need to put in less work for the same amount of money. Yeah. 
So on average, before we started free pricing, so our model was a fixed price before, now it's free pricing. A cleaner would make 12, 13 euros an hour in Berlin. Now they're up at 15, 50, 16 euros an hour, right? And customer demand is still the same. Interesting. And the uh, second question, if you can share that, I'm, I'm just curious, in, in year one, what did you have uh, in terms of product before going for uh, the first investment round? And if you can share how much, uh, what, you know, how, how much you were diluted, because it's really impressive how much capital you, you, uh, you got so in the first round. Product, we didn't have anything. Yeah? So basically a website, that was it. You put in the information and there was an intern on the back end typing, <laughs> typing the information, basically that. Yeah? Um, and, but um, we, we build a product and over time um, and now I think have a very good product. Um, and we diluted heavily because we took on so much money very early, right? So first one was, I think, 17 on a 15 valuation, for example, was the first round. So massive dilution already on the first round because we wanted to go really, really fast. Yeah? I have to say that one of our um, starting investors was Rocket Internet, which at that time, pre-IPO, um, was uh, extra aggressive and therefore um, pushing for more and more growth. Yeah? All right. Congrats. Thanks for, for the response. Thanks. So, so you said uh, to expand uh, to uh, new markets, you either buy company or recruit people there. Yeah. How, how do you scout or recruit on new markets? Do you have yeah. like internal team that does it or you outsource? You, how do you do that? So back, back when we were 500 people and in this max, um, let's say rollout phase, we had uh, basically a, a expansion team that went in, started the market, talked to the lawyers, set up the entities, um, set up the, uh, what is the privacy policy and these kind of things, um, made sure that the first with two, three language interns in that team uh, made sure that basically the, um, the, 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 the basic stuff was done and then we looked for um, a local founder in that country. But what we normally did at the same time before we entered, we already started scouting the market via all the top universities, via the competitors, looked at if there's a possibility to acquire one. Normally, if you come in, you talk to the competitor, you go in, you say, okay, either I'm gonna crush you or you work with me. Sometimes that can work very well. So basically, yeah. you need to build structures for that. It's very expensive. It's very expensive. Yeah. If you want to do it right and it doesn't fall apart and uh, there's fraud happening everywhere around the world and these kind of things, then you need structure. And that is very expensive. And um, uh, you said structures, yeah? C could you guide us how you build, build this structure on the specific market? For example, country manager that recruit uh, some people, uh, operations, yeah. say specialists, can you guide us? So we went back and forth multiple times between a very centralized and decentralized structure. So at some point, um, or let's say in the beginning, when we launched a market like Australia, we normally had one or two country managers, one more on the marketing side, one more on the operational side. We had local interns, and then later on, um, actual employees doing customer service operations and these kind of things. In the central location, we have IT, product, BI, and then all the performance marketing channels, um, and we still have that set up. The only thing that we did is that we basically fired all the operational people, outsourced them to Malaysia, Philippines, Algeria, and Sarajevo. And um, we only have very slim local country teams. So for entire Asia, so Australia, Singapore, um, it's two employees now. Yeah? The rest is outsourced. To start business, we had more people, right? Got controlled and outsourced it. As soon as the processes are clear on how to do it, we just outsource it. And we don't have the throwing microphone anymore. I think it's, I think it's broken. <laughs> One uh, of the best inventions ever. Eh? Yeah. Hi. Um, I just wonder about uh, your goals ahead. I mean, in a two or three years perspective, because it sounded as a kind of a recap of what have happened already. Yeah. But I wonder what you're aiming at in, in the nearest future. So um, the goal for the last couple of months was reaching profitability, we did, and um, now we're basically getting back to stronger growth, and we just started rolling out these other verticals. So in cleaning, we're making a ton of money, and um, we now want to basically offer to our existing users 
in a wallet functionality, one app offering all the services, we want to have the same experience to all other services as well, right? Um, so that's basically what we're starting now and rolling out. At the same time, we will focus on Southeast Asia further and we'll probably um, roll out a couple of additional uh, countries there because we now are quite good at uh, managing those countries and um, can continue to spark the growth there at very low cost. Now we don't need to send in a five-person team anymore. We just uh, fly there once basically set up the things and then we do it remotely from our Asian headquarter. You mentioned uh, entrepreneurs are better than BCG consultants <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a country manager. My co-founder is BCG consultant, so... Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I was both. <laughs> um, but uh, your advice to companies that want to uh, expand internationally uh, how to find good entrepreneurs uh, as a country managers? What more, like, more, more or less like what what uh, experience should they have in terms of years, companies? How do you find a good entrepreneur in a, in a foreign country? And if I if I knew, um, that would be <laughs> very helpful to the business. I could just give you. An, um, so we had a um, in in Asia we had a um, guy who had 15 years of experience, um, was a great guy, um, entrepreneurial thinking and banking background, and so a very good mix, right? company didn't grow. We exchange him for a 25-year-old, I run with my head through the wall guy and we're doubling or tripling all of a sudden. Yeah? So, I mean, there is really no recipe for, um, for saying that. I think it's important to be very close to the people and understand what kind of questions they're asking themselves. Um, and um, a lot of track records in terms of, uh, or talking to people who have worked with that person to understand how this person thinks and is this guy a, a hustler, right? And really getting that market started, for us at least, right? Since the business model is very different and very local and so on and so forth, you need to do that. If you just have to roll out after playbook Y, then you need a different person, right? But f finding them normally gets more difficult with now all the money flowing around in the world. Huh? Uh, we are building the marketplace for builders, building the houses for individual uh, investors. So the key question for us is how to attract good guys, especially the not very digitalized people. Do you have any kind of experience in bringing not very digitalized groups to the marketplace and how to help them use it on the one hand and on the other hand uh, convince the good ones to be on the, on the marketplace? I think convincing the good ones um, is very important that you ask yourself, um, for example, what we did wrong in the beginning is we had a fixed price model, right? In a fixed price model, the lazy one makes the same hourly rate as the great one. You have zero incentive to be awesome. Yeah? And I think thinking about that, and, and maybe you want to take a close look at the German marketplace, which is called My Hammer, which uh, miserably failed in this. And therefore, um, you can probably learn a lot from um, how they did wrong the reverse bidding and these kind of things and setting a wrong incentive. Um, how we bring the undigital people online is, um, I mean, we meet them in person or we do it over the phone, um, all outsourced, all on a per unit basis, but um, I think talking on the phone to people still creates a lot of trust because people just downloading the app and then money involved and so on and so forth, uh, that's sometimes for a big group of people is still very questionable. So. Uh, we have a fun experience now because we are sending the clients to them and we are informing them via SMS that they can just have a lead and they can contact the client interested in their services and they are afraid to take this SMS because they're afraid they're going to pay for it, for example. Yeah. So they're really, yeah. Lots of user interviews. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks a lot.